I think I'll get started now. So my talk is going to be esoteric subdomain enumeration techniques. So basically, this is going to be more on the lines of how do we find subdomains when you are an apprentice or when you are doing a bug bounty. This is going to be more like sharing the knowledge stuff. Just to get started a little bit, a little bit about me. My name is Bharat. You can figure out how to pronounce that later. I'm a security engineer at this company called AppSecO, which is a okay. We'll talk about that later. I am an offensive security certified professional. I finished it like a couple of weeks ago. So I had to boast about it. <laughs> so the idea is that today we are going to look at subdomain enumeration, and we are going to look at bunch of DNS and DNSSEC attacks. And you can actually, you feel free to run these attacks against the names over and domain that I actually gave it gave here. I am running these names over and domain, so you are free to run any attacks that I mentioned. Please do not run any DDoS or reflection attacks. That is not really appreciated. So just take a note of it: ns1.insecurednes.com. An insecure dns.com domain. So, what is this talk about? This talk is about subdomain enumeration in general, and also we are going to look at esoteric ways of doing subdomain enumeration. Whenever I talk about a technique, I'm also going to talk about the tooling around it, and also I'll talk about mitigation techniques. I do understand most of the crowd is bug hunters, but I feel that talking about mitigation actually adds values to some defenders who are here. So, sub. What is subdomain enumeration? I think most of the bug hunters already know what it is. So basically, subdomain enumeration is when you start a pen test or when you start start bug bounty hunting, you start with a single domain name and then you find a lot of subdomains and you try to look for applications and find bugs in them. So the process of finding subdomains from a domain is subdomain enumeration. So why do we do subdomain enumeration? One of the major reasons we do it is hidden and forgotten subdomains will have applications which will have critical vulnerabilities. A lot of companies. But a lot of web developers tend to put applications on very obscure subdomains and they forget about them. Those are really interesting places to find some bugs. And also, if you find a bug in one of the domains, it could be also present in other subdomains. This is something all the bug hunters would have encountered. You could make more profit if you find more subdomains with the same bug. So, just to give you an historical example, this is an example of XSS on Salesforce subdomain. It was admin.salesforce.com. And there's also Yahoo Voice hacks. It was from 2011, where there were like millions of records that came out from a subdomain. And also, you have Systema software breach, where 1.5 million US insurance records came out because they were available publicly on a subdomain of AWA, like AWS subdomain. And there is XSS on eBay subdomain. This is just to prove a point that sub, a lot of subdomains can have critical vulnerabilities, and it's pretty important as a pen tester or a bug hunter to find all these. So how do people usually find subdomains? Usually people find subdomains using Google docking. I mean, using special search operators. You could use Google, you could use Bing, but you could find a bunch of subdomains using these. And there are specialized search engines to actually find subdomains. I can think of virus total where you put a domain and you can get all the subdomains. And there's also dictionary based enumeration. If you know your if you know the organization that you are targeting well, you could create a list of subdomains that are possible and then you can actually try to resolve everything. This is a little better than doing a brute force. And the third one is obviously subdomain brute force. This is a highly inefficient way of doing it. But if you have like 1,000 or 2,000 years on your hand, you could, you could probably find all the domains. And there's also ANS discovery, which I'm not going to get into. But this is a very effective technique. But these are common subdomain enumeration techniques. But what we're going to cover today is esoteric. What does esoteric mean? It means intended or likely to be understood by a small number of people with specialized knowledge or interest. Like, uh, the techniques that I'm going to cover today are already used by few people. These are not like highly unknown or highly ex exotic ones. But when I talk to pen testers or when I talk to security professional, I've, professionals, I found that a lot of people don't understand, don't really understand these techniques or use these techniques. Few people, few people use these techniques as part of some tools like Recon NG, but they don't understand the technique itself. So that's why I'm covering this. And what are these techniques that I'm going to cover about today? I'm going to cover about certificate transparency. I'm going to cover about DNS zone walking, DNS zone transfer, and passive reconnaissance using public data sets. These are the four techniques that I'm going to cover about. So just to get the interest of the impatient people, I'm going to show this. So I ran these techniques against ICANN.org as a domain, and this is the result that I got. These are the unique subdomains that each technique found. I found around 61 using one technique. I'm going to talk about each technique later. I found 61, I found 17 using other technique, I found 45 subdomains using the other one, I found 59 using some other technique. We'll cover these techniques, but this is just to get you interested. So let's get started. 
The first technique is certificate transparency. So certificate transparency is a standard which was initiated by Google and it's now an IETF standard. So the idea is that under certificate transparency, every certificate authority, like who is who can give you a certificate, when they issue a SSL or TLS certificate, they have to put it in a public log. And this log is publicly available. Anyone can look through this log and find all the certificates issued for a given domain. So the idea is that now that anyone can look into the log and can, can get all the certificates for a domain, they can actually identify the fraudulent domains. If your domain has 10 certificates and if you find 11 on CT logs, you know that there is one fraudulent certificate out there. That is the idea. It's a brilliant, it's a brilliant idea. It's simple, but really powerful. I think it actually adds up to the security of SSL TLS as an ecosystem. It has been proven successful in the past. You can actually find all the subdomains. Yeah, this is the official website for certificate transparency. It's certificate-transparency.org. If you go to slash known logs, you can get all the log files, the details about the log files itself. This is, these are the log files you can actually look into and you can get a lot of information about it. So this is the idea. You have SSL and TLS certificates in one log file. But why are we talking about certificate transparency in a subdomain enumeration perspective? Because CT logs has an interesting side effect. The side effect is that anybody can look into the log now and actually can get all your SSL and TLS certificates for a domain. And all the SSL TLS certificates will have subdomain, your subdomain information. So when when an attacker can get your certificates, he can also gain a lot of information about the infrastructure, like internal domains, email addresses. And the brilliant part about this technology is that it's going to be completely passive because the certificates are not maintained by the organization itself. So it's going to be completely passive and it's a, it's a brilliant attack. So how do you search through these logs? You can search through CT logs using various search engines. They are like, they are standard search engines like CRT.sh, which is by Komodo CA. You can search through the logs. There is census.io. This is by University of Michigan, I guess. They actually aggregate all the known SSL TLS certificates and also the CT logs. And the last one is obviously by Google, which is a very good search engine. So just to give you an example, I put a very large organization's name in CRT.sh search engine. I got these results. This is just one page of results. Actually, I got around six pages. I wanted to crop it so that I can put it in a slide. So there were like six pages and around 400 entries for a single organization. If you look into it, there is Drupal, there is web team, and there are a bunch of things. I actually found a bunch of production servers, staging servers in this list, which is very interesting. There's no other way of getting these subdomains except CT logs because I tried the other techniques, they did not work. And there's level up here. This has nothing to do with our conference. This is not bug crowd. This is just a very different organization. So this is how you find subdomains. And I actually wrote a very simple script. This will, this will go through the CT logs and it will find all the subdomains for an organization. And also it will get you the email addresses. Thinking from an attacker perspective, this is brilliant because you can actually get all the subdomains and can find critical vulnerabilities. If you get email addresses, if you are an attacker, if you're an adversary, you could do a targeted phishing. Depends on your motives. So let's do a very simple demo. I actually wrote a simple script using the APIs for CRT.sh. CRT.sh, the Komodo one, has RSS feed and census as an official API. So I wrote simple scripts. Let's do this. Subdomain enumeration is sir.sh. And I'm just to be safe, I'll just do it against IETF.org. The way this script works is, just need to give domains. And by the way, all the scripts are available in GitHub account of my company. I'm going to give the link in the end. So this is interesting. So you get the GitHub accounts, GitHub repository where you can get this link, get these scripts. Don't worry about that too much. So I ran this against IETF dog or using CRT.sh. So I got a bunch of subdomains. This, this is very interesting. You, to do, do you have services you have sql i1 this way i'm not you could run it against a very large organization you would get like hundreds of results but i'm not going to run it now so this is pretty interesting i can also run it against let's wait for a couple of seconds let's see yes if you run it against i can you get a bunch of other interesting stuff this is pretty neat OW is outlook web access, I guess. See, So the other thing I talked about now CRT.sh is done. I talked about subdomain enumeration using census. How do I do this? Okay, target domain. I wrote it a very long time ago, so I have no 
I forgot how this works. Do, do, do. So I got around 16 domains, but there are a bunch of cloud flares and stuff. The way I do it is, I could just grab four dot. Neat, you got a bunch of subdomains, not as much as crt.sh, but you got a bunch of results. This is nice, not really bad. So now we saw how to do subdomain enumeration using crt.sh on census.io. You can get the scripts later. So how do you mitigate this? Now city logs, so certificate transparency is, go, transparency is going to be made mandatory by Google in April, 2018. So for every CA has to log the certificates they issue in a log file from April, 2018. So this is, you can't avoid it. If you are going to have an SSL TLS certificate with a public CA, you, you, your domains are going to be out there. So how do you mitigate it? One of the obvious things that people think about when I talk to them is not having SSL and TLS support which is not really recommended at all. If you have a, if you have a service running on internet, if you have a web application or anything, it should have SSL TLS. Even if it, if it has sensitive information or not, it doesn't matter. It should have SSL and TLS support. That's my opinion. And the other interesting thing is if you are a large enough organization, if you have a large team, then you could go for your own public PKI, a private PKI, like public key infrastructure so that your logs, your domains don't end up in a public log file. At this point, I have to mention that Cloudflare has a very interesting project called a CFSSL. I'm going to put these links in the slides that I'll publish. So Cloudflare has CFSSL. This project will help you to actually deploy your own PKI. And there's also other project by Cloudflare called a Cert Manager, which will also help you do the same, which will make you automate the CFSSL process. And the other way you could avoid it is you can opt out of city logs, but the problem is that city logs is a brilliant technology. You don't want to opt out and lose the security benefit of city. And the other thing is that name reduction in city logs. Uh, name reduction is still being debated. The idea is that your subdomain information will be redacted from the log files. But if you're going to redact your subdomain information, it's very hard for you to track your certificates. And also redacted entries are not going to be recognized by Google as, uh, are not going to be recognized by Google and you won't get a green bar in Chrome anymore after April 2018. So name reduction is sort of not useful. So these are your mitigation ideas, you could use any of those. So let's get to DNS. Now that certificate transparency is done, let's get to DNSSEC. How do you do enumeration using DNSSEC? DNSSEC is supposed to be a secure way of doing DNS. I'll just talk about it. I'll explain you DNSSEC in, a, in one minute. So let's not worry about it because the idea of this talk is not to understand DNSSEC because it's a huge topic. The idea is to understand the parts of DNSSEC that will help you do subdomain enumeration. So DNSSEC is like normal DNS, but it will, uh, it will protect you from uh, DNS spoofing by using cryptographic signatures. The idea is that you have normal uh, DNS records like A, what A and MX records. And in DNS, and in DNSSEC, your server is going to sign them with a private key and it's going to put the signature. Let me just give you. So DNSSEC is going to have, it's a little tricky, I'll explain you. DNSSEC has a bunch of new records, RRC, which is resource record signature. So all your normal DNS records are going to be signed with a private key and the cryptographic signature is going to be available in your zone file itself. And to verify it, you need a public key because they signed it with a private key. And the public key is also available in your zone file as DNS key. Just to give you an example, let me do this. Do you... So yeah, when you get an A record, you also get our signature. This is the signature and you can verify it using DNS key. Sorry. So that's how you do it. But the DNSSEC is not the point of the talk. We are going to, the interesting parts which are helpful for subdomain enumeration are NSEC and NSEC3. I'll just explain very quickly what they are. What they are. So in DNS, when a client queries for a non-existent domain, you the server must actually tell that the domain doesn't exist. In DNS, the way it happens is there is a DNS answer type called as NX domain, non-existent domain. And in, DN, in normal DNS, it's very easy to do because there's no cryptographic signatures, but it's very hard to do in DNSSEC. Why? Because if your NX domain responses or your non-existent domain responses are going to be generic, attacker can spoof these responses and they can actually create a DDoS scenario. So this can be avoided using on the fly signing. What I mean is if you can, when you get a query for a non-existent domain, you can actually sign it dynamically on the fly. And this will actually solve it for you. But the problem is it's going to create a performance and security issue. What I mean by this is DNS is distributed. So if you are going to 
dynamically sign it, you have to give your private key to all the slave servers, which is a security problem. And also if you're going to dynamically sign, it's a performance problem. So this is out of, you can rule it out. And pre-signing every non-existent domain is impossible because there are infinite possibilities. So rather than signing something that is infinite, the guy, people who wrote the standards came up with something interesting. They came up with some, they came up with an idea where you actually sign something finite. The things that are finite here are domains that actually exist. So the way it works is when you ask every existing domain, every domain that exists will have something called as an NSEC record, which will point to the next secure record, like the next record that actually exists. For example, when I ask for something called firewall.com with four L's, this doesn't exist. This doesn't exist. So the answer is going to be, it will give you the NSEC record of firewall itself. So it says from firewall till mail, there is nothing. So you created a finite space. Any domain that falls in between, it's going to get the same answer. It's a little tricky and you have to have a little out of the box thinking to understand this concept, but don't worry too much about it. You can actually read about it. So, but NSEC, the idea is that when you ask for non-existent domain, you get two. You get, it's, it basically says there's nothing between X and Y. This is brilliant. Using this technique, you can actually walk the whole zone. This is like, this is again like zone transfers, but by design. Let me do this. There is a tool called as LDNS walk, which will automate this process for you. This is part of LDNS utilities. Let me just do this on my own domain. LD, sorry, LDNS walk. So this is my name server, this is my server. I'm going to use LDNS walk. Interesting, I, it walked the zone actually. So it started with insecurednscom It asked for the NSEC record. It got champ and then it went to conference, the AMP, firewall, secrets, staging. They don't actually exist, so don't worry. Don't bother finding them. So this is brilliant. Using LDNS walk, we actually walk the zone of zone which uses NSEC records. So DNSSEC is supposed to protect you, but the problem with DNSSEC is that it will make your zone vulnerable for zone walking. This is nice. So this is how you install LDNS utilities if you want to install it. You can actually, I'll publish the slide so you can actually look at it. So the way LDNS walk, walk works is just in a simple terms. It's going to ask for the NSEC record of something that exists and you're going to get an answer. Of, in the answer, you will have the next domain, for example, doo -doo -doo. Sorry. Sorry. Nice. In the answer, you have champ. And if you're going to use champ, you'll get the next one, conference. So it's a linked list. So you're just walking the linked list and you're doing a zone walking. So this is how you do it. This is like zone transfers. It's it's a fabulous technique. If somebody is using NSEC, you could just walk the zone. So this is how you extract just the subdomain part. It's good for scripting purposes. So I just did the demo already. So let's skip this part. So NSEC three. So NSEC is obviously vulnerable, and there's no doubt about it. So people who did the standards they came up with something called as NSEC three. The only thing that you need to know about NSEC three is it's like NSEC. But the idea is that if you look at the record, I'm going to explain the record in a minute. But if you look at the record, it's hashes. It's not domains anymore. You can't read it. So this is supposed to prevent zone transfers or at least make it expensive because this is hashes. Just to give you an example, this is the simplest example of a zone file. So you have example.com and this is the hash of example.com. Don't worry about the dot example because they just added it for aesthetic purpose, I guess. So example.com NSEC record is NSEC three record is pointing at www.example.com and www.example.com is pointing at example.com. If you have more, it will have more. This is the simplest case. So you can actually, so looking at this, they are hashes, but the idea is that you can actually randomly ask for non-existent domains and you can collect all the hashes and you can crack the hashes offline. So that's how you do zone walking in NSEC three. So this is just to prove the point that you can actually collect. So just going back at it. So these hashes are not plain hashes. They are actually salted and the salt is available in the record itself. And the number before the salt, which I did not, I forgot to point, is the number of iterations of hashing that is done. So if you have this information, you could use the tool called as LDNS NSEC3 hash, and you can actually calculate the hashes. 
P3 is the number of iterations, hyphen S is the salt, and you give the domain, you get it. Just look at it. It starts with 231, which is example.com. It's same as here, just to prove a point. So how do you walk this? It's NSEC3 is a little relatively secure, but it's not completely secure. You have tools like NSEC3 Walker and NSEC3 Map to automate the process of collecting the hashes and also cracking the hashes. But the idea is that you could actually manually collect the hashes and also crack the hashes using Hashcat. With the amount of the hardware or GPU power these days, you could crack them really fast. So the idea is, you could go to, this is the tool, I just installed it. The way you do it is, do, collect as a script and then you just give, I'll just copy paste it to save the time. Okay, anyway. Do, do, do. So you just leave the script for a while. I think I left it last time for like five minutes or something, and it got a reasonable amount of uh, reasonable amount of hashes. You have hashes dot I can. Let me do this again. Do, do, do. Just to show you the demo of it. Let me just do this. Do, do, do. That's just the file name. So it'll actually uncrack it for you and you get a list of it. So then doing it now, it'll actually do it in a couple of minutes. I actually got this done already. So that should be this, I can do hashes. I'll just give an example. Cool. This is actually cracked and you got a bunch of answers. It says 3%. This is something that I did last time. So I'll just give you an example. This is the command. I'm just too lazy to type it out. So when I do the file, when I did unhashing, I created a file and I'm just gripping for the part where there is subdomain and I'm just using awk to get the right tool. So when you, I collected the hashes and then I cracked the hashes, I put it in a file and when I read the file, I have a bunch of subdomains. This is around 45. If you wanna just check, don't you see hyphen L? Yeah, this is 45. So you got all the subdomains. Interesting, there's no other way of getting it. It's very hard to get otherwise. So now you know that you can actually walk a NSEC zone and NSEC3 zone. So this is one of the classic examples where you, you try to put a security mechanism and it makes you a little insecure. Actually, the examples that I covered, certificate transparency and DNS zone walking is an example for that. HTTPS is supposed to protect you, but right now you are a little vulnerable when you use it. Even with DNSSEC, when you use DNSSEC, you, have, you are prone to zone walking. So this is security mechanisms making you a little insecure. So this is how you install NSEC3 Walker. I just put it for the reference perspective, reference point of view. You could actually do this. You could install it and then you could run your own on a bunch of domains. Demo time, it's already done. So I'm going to talk about zone transfers. Zone transfers are not really esoteric and they're like early 2000 attacks. People have this conception, but I'm just going to cover them. So zone transfer basically is not an attack. It's a DN type of DNS transaction. DNS is distributed. You have a bunch of servers located. There's a master server and there'll be a bunch of slave servers which will get the data from master server. So the way slave servers get the data from master server is using drone zone transfers. They initiate a slave servers, initiate a zone transfer against a master and it will send you the zone file. The problem comes or the attack comes when the zone transfers are not securely configured. So if it's not securely configured, anyone can actually initiate a zone transfer, zone transfer against a master server can get the zone file. The zone file will contain information about the zone and the host residing in it, so it's a security problem. It's a classic attack a few years ago. So this is how you do it. AXFR is how you do a full zone transfer. You use dig AXFR against a name server and a domain. These guys actually fixed it after I won them. So just to see an example, dig AXFR. I'm going to put this domain name, name server on the domain even after the talk. So you could, you could use this as a POC. 
sorry, I did some, oh, shit. Sure. So, oh yeah, just to give you an example, when I do this, this is an example of failed transaction. That's how it should be, but I do this. You get this, this is a zone transfer. I got all the zone file. You can actually see secrets.in, secret.dns and bunch of other things. This is zone transfer. So how do you protect yourself? So before that, are zone transfers relevant anymore? This is an interesting question because people think that it has really old attacks and they might not work nowadays. But the, but the truth is, yes, zone transfers are a little rare these days. You can't find it on public DNS servers because the default security settings of a lot of zones, server, zones so DNS servers are pretty secure. So it's a little hard to find them. But it is, in my experience, when you do internal pen test infrastructure assessments, it is pretty common to find DNS servers with liberal zone transfer permissions because administrators tend to think that it's an internal network so they could afford to not be really secure. And other interesting thing is that even top level name servers accidentally enable global zone transfer. This is a very classic example. There's North Korean DNS leak and there's Russian DNS leak, which happened like a couple of weeks ago or a month ago. So basically the top level name servers, they actually enable global DNS zone transfers. So it's sort of relevant. If they do it at that level, normal administrators might probably do that as well. So there's something interesting. There's something you should look at when you're doing a pen test or bug bounty. How do you mitigate this? The way you mitigate it is you could use IP based filtering. You could only let few of the IP addresses to do a zone transfer. I just gave you an example of how to do it in bind. This is how you do it over the server for all the server. This is how you do it for a single zone in a more granular way. So the idea is that you could restrict it by on the basis of IP address. But the problem with everything with IP address is that it's susceptible to spoofing. So for example, if you're doing an internal pen test, this is something I actually did in a pen test and it was, it was fabulous because it was completely exciting. So I was in an internal pen test and there is a name server, which there's a master server, which does, which did not allow zone transfers. It allowed it only from a slave server. So what I did was I wrote a scape POC. I initiated an, I initiated a zone transfer as a secondary name server. I, and the master server gave the zone data out on the network. I sniffed the zone data. This is a brilliant attack. So IP based filters are prone to spoofing, susceptible to IP address spoofing. How do you mitigate this? In DNSSEC, there is this standard called as tra transaction signatures. But I'm not going to cover what transaction signatures are, but the idea is that using cryptographic hashing, you can actually know if the sender is who he says he is and the receiver is who he says he is. So if you are running a DNS server, it's, you must have TSIG or else you are prone to spoofing attacks. Just something to look into for defenders. So at this point, I get into something called passive reconnaissance. So passive reconnaissance is where an attacker tries to gather a lot of information about the target organization without generating any traffic between him and the target organization directly. So this is very, this is very interesting. And the idea is that the idea is to be stealthy and to leave low or no footprint. So if you think about it, we have in the techniques that we have covered so far, there's one of the techniques which is completely passive. I, I obviously mentioned that it's certificate transparency. So passive reconnaissance is just brilliant and it's pretty effective from an attacker point. So from a subdomain enumeration perspective, how do you do passive reconnaissance? You could use public data sets. So there is this project called scans.io on project Sona, where they can gather internet wide scan information like port scans, dumps of all the DNS records they can find and they put it in a website. They make it available for all the security researchers. And you can actually find a bunch of subdomains, domains in the in their data. This is like finding needle in your haystack, but it's worth the it's worth going through the pain. I have actually found a lot of API endpoints and insecure servers using this technique. It's it's brilliant. So just to give you one example, there is a there are a lot of data sets. You could do a bunch of them, a number of things on that. But just to give you an example, one of the data sets is Rapid7 publishes its forward forward DNS data sets on scans.io. It has the aim is to have all the domains that are found on the internet. It's a massive data set. It's 20 plus GB of text, so it's it's huge. And the format is zzip compressed JSON file. So, I, so there's this command, using this command, you can actually just replace it with your target domain. And you can actually find the subdomains of this domain in the 20 GB file. This is very brilliant. At first I thought it's sort of ineffective because it's like finding needle in a haystack. But when I did it for a bunch of domains, it was interesting. I found a bunch of interesting subdomains. This is good. So I think these are the techniques that I actually wanted to cover. So I actually made the cheat sheet. This is a PDF format. You can actually get it from the 
GitHub repository over here. I just gave the link. So this is the cheat sheet of all the things that I actually covered in this talk. You have the data resources, you have the techniques, you have the installation mechanisms. It is supposed to work as a subdomain enumeration cheat sheet. You can, act, you can download it from here. You can actually download it from this repository. So this, that was supposed to be the end of the talk, but then I have a bonus round. I'm going to talk about another technique. This, is, this has been pointed by one of my colleagues like a couple of days ago. So I call this making Cloudflare do DNS enumeration for you. What exactly is this? So when you go to Cloudflare, when you create an account and when you want to, when you want Cloudflare as your DNS provider, you do something called add site and give you give your domain name. And when you give your domain name, it's, it doesn't check if you own the domain or not. It's just going to do some DNS enumeration for you. So this is basically making Cloudflare do DNS enumeration for you. The way you do it is you log into Cloudflare, create an, create an account, log into Cloudflare, go to add site, just give your target domain as the site you want to add. Then Cloudflare is not going to make any checks. The only check it does is, I think it does one check. The only check it does is the website that you're going to add, your target domain shouldn't be part of Cloudflare already. That's the only thing. It shouldn't be, you shouldn't be using Cloudflare as a DNS provider. So just wait for the Cloudflare to do DNS enumeration for you. This will be the results. I just gave ICANN.org as I can dot org as a site I want to add, and it did, it did some DNS enumeration for me. This is brilliant. Like it's again passive because if you create a dummy account, and Matt Brandt, mandatory programmer, the DNS hacker, he wrote a neat, neat little script to automate this process. Let's look at this process. I'm not. I can't assure you if this is going to work because I did it. I overdid it today, so they might have put a capture on my account. So let's see if it works. It works, or else you could try it on your own time. How do I do this? Okay, I give an email under the domain. Okay. You did not see that email. It's my dummy account, please. Don't judge me. So let's do I can do it. Doesn't matter. I'm really sorry. I actually forgot the password for my account. So <laughs> I'll have to remember that. But anyway, this is how it should work. You give it, you give a password. I actually modified this tool a little bit. I have the version on my GitHub account. And when you give it, it's going to give you a CSV format with all the subdomains. And you could use this command to get just the subdomains. I just did it yesterday. So it's a brilliant technique. I can demo it now. It's going to take a bit of time. So the script is available on GitHub. So I think that's the idea. So I ran it against, just to give you an example, I ran it against IANA.org and I found the subdomains. The interesting part is when I did it against ICANN, the highest number of unique subdomains were found by CRT.sh. If you go back and look at that image. But over here, it's only six from CRT.sh, it's three from census. But they use, IANA uses DNSSEC with NSEC records. I found 48 domains using this and Cloudflare found 16. So the idea that I want, the thing that I want to emphasize is not one technique will work against all the domains. These guys might not have a lot of SSL TLS certificates, so they're low on this area and they're high over here. So if you had no zone working, there's no way of finding all those 48 subdomains. So when you're doing subdomain enumeration, it's worth checking out all the techniques. Uh, that is sort of the end of the talk. And if you want to find the scripts, if you, just to give you an example, if you want to find the scripts, if you want to find the cheat sheet that I mentioned, or if you want to find the slides itself, I'm going to put the slides in a while. You can go to this GitHub account, GitHub account. It's AppSecco Buckroud Level Up Subdomain Enumeration. And you can find everything over there. So these are the references. If you want to read, I just covered tip of the iceberg. You can actually read more about these techniques over here. There are a few more brilliant techniques out there. So I did most of this talk in my paid time at my office. So it's totally fair that I put this slide. I work for AppSeco and this is what we do. It's a fantastic company, fabulous work. And that's it. If you guys have any questions, I'm going to take it now.